So I was asked to speak to Nehemiah chapter 8 as part of the Nehemiah series. And um, it's, a, it's a chapter that's meant a lot to me for more than 25 years, from the Cape Town time, and I'll try and explain to you why later on. But what I'd like to do is, before we talk about it, is to just read it. So I think we can have this. There we go. It is a fairly long chapter. It's got 18 verses to it. It's not that long. I guess it's a medium-sized chapter. And it's got some strings of names. I'm going to avoid the names because they're not really relevant to us that much this morning. So the start of this chapter comes from the previous chapter, of course, and it says just the last few verses of the previous chapter, and when the seventh month had come, the people of Israel were in their towns. And then they were moved to gather together, as we're going to read now. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. And so Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read it, read from it, facing the square before the water gate. From early morning until midday. I'm not going to be reading that long. <laughs> In the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood six people <laughs> on his right hand. And seven people stood on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And then it lists... 13 Levites who helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe and the Levites who taught the people, said to the, all the people, This day is holy to the Lord, your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. And then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they understood the words that were declared to them. So that was the first day of this month. And now the second day, the heads of fathers' houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites came together to Ezra, the scribe, in order to study the words of the law. And they found in it written, in the law, that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the first, the feast of seven months, of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim it and publish it in their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths, as it is written. And so the people went out and brought them made booths for themselves, each, some of them on his roof, in their courts where they lived, in the courts of the house of God, and in the square at the water gate, and in a square at the gate of Ephraim. And all the assembly of those who had returned from captivity made booths and lived in the booths, 
For from the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, to that day, the people of Israel had not done so. And there was very great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. And they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. Why this passage has um, stirred me so much, I will still explain a little bit later, but it's because it seems to me almost like an Old Testament revival. It's as people read God's word or had God's word read to them, there was a movement amongst them. And it resulted in a manifestation (laughs) And the manifestation was one of weeping. And I guess it's that which I have identified with. And it reminds me very much of when the Holy Spirit fell in Acts chapter 2. But there was a different manifestation then. When it looked like flames of fire were on their heads. And they spoke with other tongues. And, um, but this is a, a different manifestation of God. And it really affected me greatly as I, as I will explain. So I, I, I went through this passage and I just picked on four things to highlight. There's a lot that one could refer to in this passage. And the first one, in fact, we've been ministered to a lot this morning already in the prayer meeting. Because it talks about how that the people gathered before into the square before the water gate. So the, the water gate apparently was, we would imagine, where the old Jerusalem got its water from. Um, the, those of us or those people who have been to Jerusalem, it's the new Jerusalem, a new age Jerusalem, I guess, that we see now. The old Jerusalem was the city of David and has been destroyed um, almost totally. But there was a water gate and apparently there wasn't much room in the, in the tabernacle or the temple as it existed at that time. This was the place for them to gather. But what I think we need to notice here is that they gathered as one man. That's a generic man. Because in verse 2 and verse 3, it talks about being men and women. So it was people gathered there. But one gets the sense as they gathered there of unity. They gathered there together. And in the prayer meeting, it talked about how that relationships are so important. And the, the thing about Christianity at its root is that it is not a religion. And for those people who know Christianity, know that it's not a religion. Those people outside think it is a religion. But it really is relationships. And that Lord taught us so carefully. It's a relationship with God first, and then with your neighbor. And he used those two things to sum up the Ten Commandments. And if you think about the Ten Commandments, that you must love the Lord your God and have no other gods before you, and honor your father and mother, and don't lie to each other, and don't covet people's things, and it's all to do with relationships. And when we think of a, a sermon like the Sermon on the Mount, it is totally about relationship. And I think if the relationships are right, then we can experience in our lives now, not some other time, the kingdom of God, and in the lives of our family, and in the lives of the people that we come into contact with, absolutely dependent upon these sound relationships. And if one thinks of the Sermon on the Mount touched me hugely a number of years ago, but if we just think about some of the things that it said there, for example, Jesus says to them, don't be angry with your brother. And I used to for years think, it says, it says don't murder, but I tell you don't be angry. And I used to think, well, don't be angry, because if you get angry, it will result in wanting to murder them. But in fact, that's not the point. The point is, just don't be angry. It's something that's so difficult for so much to do, uh, for many of us to do. And then he was said in the next little part to that, don't insult your brother, don't call him a fool. And it's something that, you know, the only thing we can do is actually listen to Jesus and do what he told us to do. And now this is another one really challenging about relationships. He said, if you want to come and do a spiritual thing, like bring your gift to the altar, 
And then you remember that your brother's got something against you. Not you've got against your brother, but your brother's get against you. Leave your gift. Don't offer it. Go and fix that thing first. And then come and offer your gift to the altar. And um, I put up uh, some verses. Uh, let's see the next one. It's in uh, Psalm chapter 133, verse 1 to 3. And this is, uh, it says, this is the one I think we know pretty well. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers to dwell together in unity. And then it's like the precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down the collar of his robes. It's like the dew of Hermon which falls in the mountains of Zion for there the Lord has commanded the blessing. Life forevermore. Quite a strange thing to say in an Old Testament context. Life forevermore because of the unity that exists amongst the brethren. And I often think about this particular passage. Imagine if the Jewish people were divided. God could not have poured out himself into their lives as he did on this particular day that's referred to here. So it's a fundamental aspect of being a disciple. And what I've appreciated in coming to this church, because I feel very strong in this way as well, is the sense of unity that you have with other churches. I really think that honors God. Not only other churches, though. It's all people. You know, people are just your friend and it's, it's, that you haven't met. It's kind of a disposition that we have to have. And practically, it's very difficult to work constantly with other churches because that's not how easy it is. But in your heart, it's a matter of, I'm there to support you. I want you to be successful. If you are successful, it doesn't mean that I'm less successful. You know, so it's this spirit of generosity towards each other. And to really bring this home, I thought if we could just have a look at John chapter 17 and verse 20. Because this is part of the Lord's Prayer. And in it, he said, he, he was praying for the people he was going to leave behind, knowing that he was going to go away. And he said, not only the people that you've given me now, but they're going to be speaking to other people, and those other people are going to become your children as well. So I, don't want, I want to pray for them as well. And I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. And we've joined that line of people. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, that the world might believe that you have sent me. Now, that is a tremendous standard. Jesus said, Father, may they be one, just as you and I are one. Uh, you're in me, I'm in you, may they be part of that. Or part of a unity like that's a very exacting um, unity that Jesus is looking for in us. And if we get that right, then that world will believe that you have sent me. And there are several other passages, as John chapter 13, I'm just going to quote for this for you, but a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you're also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for another. And there's a book that was written that's called The Mark of a Christian. And the mark of a Christian is that they love each other. And that the world may know um, that you've sent me is seen when the church demonstrated, not only for love for each other, but for love across the churches. And this loving people and looking after people, it's almost each of us has to get together with our own life situations. And these can be very challenging, especially family situations as we were praying for this morning, but friends and so on. But just to ask God, God, how do you want me to be one 
with all these people as we are one. Recognizing, I think it helps me a lot to recognize how broken I am. Because if I recognize how broken I am, then it's easier for me to recognize or to excuse or to forgive the brokenness in other people. And we have to recognize that Jesus, when he talks in the Sermon on the Mount, and he talks about the beam in our own eye, you see beam in other people's eyes, but you don't see a beam in my own eye. He's not talking about other people. He's talking about me. You know, we, we always think, oh, it's got to be that, the beam in your eye. But his real point was, no, it's a beam in your own. And because I'm broken, I can't often see the beam that's in my eye or the weaknesses that I have. But the whole idea is to, be, to, to recognize that we've all got brokennesses. And to allow for that and to just honor God in this way. And in fact, it goes on further. It could make a case, which I'm not going to de- do now, that in fact, if, if we love each other, it's also a witness to principalities and powers of the church and the wisdom of the church. So it's, it affects so many things. So this is a, a hugely essential part of being a believer. So they gathered in front of the water gate. And the people then wanted to hear from God. They'd been in exile for a while, and they wanted to hear from God. And so if we read in that passage in Nehemiah, perhaps you can just bring it up again. Normally, it would be the pastors or the ministers who say to the people, people, let's, let's do these things. These are the spiritual disciplines. We need to do these things. But here it was the people. The people desired, and they said, Ezra, Come, we want you to read to us, not the other way around. And in many ways, we need to look after our own spiritual growth. Our growth is not dependent upon somebody else. But we can always ask other people to come and help us. But the people took responsibility and said, Ezra, please come and read to us. And so Ezra then stood on his platform so that his sound would go over their heads And he read to them from the book of the law of Moses. Now, I think that would be pretty dryish reading to me. But they wanted to contact God. They wanted God to speak to them. And God did. He spoke to them. And I try and think of who we have to speak to us now when we read the Word of God. And now we have the very Son of God who we can hear words from. You know, this struck me a number of years ago. It was through the Sermon on the Mount. And it was reading it very carefully and seeing the brokenness of myself as I went through the Sermon on the Mount. And it was as though Jesus understood why the world is in a mess that it is in. And it came to my mind, or to my heart, that this man was the wisest person that ever lived. He understood what it was to be human in a way that I had evidence for. I'm a scientist. I didn't say that. but And scientists look for evidence. And where was the evidence of this man's wisdom? (laughs) <laughs> you know, that person you described, I, can, I know, it's, it's, it's like me, you know. So, um, and then uh, uh, we've been listening uh, to this lovely ministry on the internet, and Dallas Willard is a person and then I, who we get a lot of from. And listening to Dallas Willard, he says that same thing so often. Christ was the wisest person who ever lived. And uh, Dallas, you kind of, you know, we all come up with the same, and Dallas is a uh, professor of, Philosophy at the University of Southern California. I've been in one of the sciences, microbiology. So he, and, and it is exactly like that. It's almost that like you see, oh God, if only we could, Jesus, if only we could understand what you told us and do what you told us. You who have inside information of who, who, how the world works. People would run around and listen to Confucius or somebody else who they think is a wise person. I said this to a, a friend who, who was at a house. I said, Jesus is the wisest person who ever looked. He said, oh, 
I thought Solomon was. <laughs> so we were always taught about Solomon, and of course Solomon was a wise man, but I'm afraid Solomon is, doesn't got the wisdom of this man. You know? And because this man is so wise, one almost needs to take the words that he said and look at each of them very carefully. And I've, I've asked to also just put up another scripture, which I think is just a, a marvelous scripture. Uh, the first has got one of Ezra. Uh, and Ezra had prepared himself to minister to these people or to read to these people. And I think I'm going to skip that one and go to the one in Hebrews, chapter 1 and verses 1 to 3. And the writer of the Hebrews says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom all things he created, whom also he created the world. So this man is, is, a person, is the way that God has spoken to us. This is the son of God. And we could look at what he said and look at it very carefully, because in there is great wisdom. In fact, in every word there is great wisdom. And very often when we don't follow something, it's just because we haven't understood it. And we have to have almost like they did, where they gather into groups and they had the Levites explain to them, we have to find ourselves, but if we can't find ourselves, listen to other ministry. Because God has blessed us with wonderful ministry. Uh, not only here, which, and it's, again another thing we've really enjoyed here, is the variety of ministry, the sort of open pulpit, and hearing what I consider to be young people, Ministering what comes out of their, out of their hearts and so on. It, it really is just such a blessing. But and we learn, learn all the time. I'll tell you what I learned uh, last week, uh, Paul, and I wish I'd known it. And that is, <laughs> maybe not the scripture. Yes, Focus Fox. I was managed to have children without, <laughs> without knowing about Focus Fox, but I think it would have helped me in lab meetings. <laughs> okay. No, that's joking. But. Uh, <laughs> but what a blessing it is to, to hear from each other. And this wise man. And you know, Jesus said some absolutely outrageous things. I once wrote down to myself, what are some of the outrageous things he did? And I tried to rank them. But here is an absolutely outrageous thing that Jesus said. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Wow, that is just insane. <laughs> you mean all these other people have written stuff. You know, it's gonna, they're going to pass away, but his words won't pass away. Why not? I just think scientifically. Now the, the universe is 13.6 million years old, and the earth is 4.5 billion years old. Sorry, billion years old. The sun is 180 million years older than the earth. And we know that it's halfway through its life and it's going to expand and it's going to fry. My words will not pass away. Why not? Because they're rooted in a kingdom. They explain us to us the principles behind what we see. And those, that kingdom will endure forever. So his words will not pass away. He knows what he's talking about. And this is a person... So, so when we read, when we hear from him, we're hearing from a deep source that there isn't another one like that. And as Ezra began to read then, he prayed. And he said, um, hallowed be your name, equivalent of, he blessed God. And everybody said, amen, amen. And they began to listen to the words that he said. And then what happened to the people is that there was a weeping that came before them. Now, this is a kind of a, 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 this is a fairly personal thing, really, but it's why I enjoy this passage so much. So much. Um, when we were in Cape Town, we had a set of meetings one time. It lasted like four or five days every night. And I went along to these meetings. I was part of the leadership, I guess, of, of the church at that time. And I went along to these meetings. And I just sat there and I listened to them. And I can't remember, it was about the second or third night, just listening to ministry. And it was though from my eyes they just came tears. They just pour out. Not a crying like, um, although I don't think I could have spoken very much then, but just coming from the eyes in a way that it's hard to, to explain. 
Um, and but since then, I find that I get overwhelmed pretty easily and by all sorts of things in this sort of way. And I heard one of the, they were pulling Bates's leg. I have to be very careful because if once it grabs me, I have, you know, it just wells up within you. And the thing is, it's not a sad thing. So this is what happened to them. And once I read this passage, I said, that, I recognize what happened to the people in Ezra's day is exactly what I had experienced. And I identify with that. And it was like God just coming on you in some way that's very difficult to describe. It's not a sadness, even though you're weeping. It's I think it's an overwhelming sense of gratitude. It's blessing uh, that you feel. It's a peace that you feel. It's a, a sense of thing, why me? Um, it's worship. It's all these sorts of things that just come and well up within one. And that is why I believe this was the Spirit of God coming upon these people in that time. And it resulted later on, as we'll see in as the weeks go on, in much repentance and much confession. And then it's almost a sort of a revival in amongst these people. But it was by them exposing themselves to the word of God, and especially over a period. It can just have this effect on you. It's just an amazing thing. It's when Jesus talks about it being bread and, and uh, water, you know, to, he's like, it is what it is. You, you eat of it, and it does something to you. And we have been given such a privilege to be able to do that. Okay, I'm going to, I had a whole lot of stuff that I'm going to leave out of here because I see time has gone on much faster than I thought it would do. But the people, the, the priests were worried about this. Don't weep, don't weep, don't weep. Because today is a day of celebration. It was, in fact, the Feast of Trumpets because it was the first day of the seventh month. And I didn't know very much about this, but I believe the Jews had two calendars that ran for 12 months each, and they were six months apart. And this was the start of the civil year, and the first of the first would be the start of the sacred year. So this was the, the civil year, and they would blow trumpets and so on, and they would have a feast together. And that is also so important about being a believer, is being able to celebrate things, and to celebrate things in the presence of God, and to rejoice in God and who He is. And... Um, it's part of leadership, in fact, is to be able to encourage people who work with you to celebrate and to rejoice in the successes that people have and to rejoice with each other. And this is what they were to do that day. And for those people who were left out, bring them in. Uh, you know, those who don't have the resources, come and join with us that we would celebrate together. And I, I love the, uh, I've heard John Piper being quoted, and he's got many, many sermons, hundreds of sermons. I remember listening to 52 sermons on Hebrews of John Piper. You know, just down, download for the interview. It's just a mass of stuff that he's got there. But he's in this Bethlehem Baptist Church in Minnesota, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And the statement that he gives is, he talks about Christian hedonism. In other words, you know, Hedonism is when you seek pleasure, but take your pleasure in God and with each other, with the family of God. Be hedonistic about it, because God is most glorified in you when you are most satisfied in Him. So, and it all goes together. It's all part of this well-being of being in the kingdom of God. Um, so, I'm not going to go on very much more about celebration, although I was going to, to um, do that. I'm not so sure about the sweet wine that he talks about, and I believe sweet wine doesn't sell in the Western Cape, only, only dry wines. But uh, quite, I'm quite partial to port, mind you. I don't drink much wine. <laughs> and then... The last little passage, which I'm also going to deal with very inadequately, but this will lead us into breaking of bread, was the Feast of Booths. It's called here, but it's a Feast of Tabernacles in the, normally, uh, as, as it's known these days. And I guess I have often been under the impression that a tabernacle was the place that they built in the wilderness and where God 
presenced himself amongst the people of Israel. But in fact, tabernacle is just an informal dwelling. And this Feast of Tabernacles was to remind the Jewish people of the time when they were captive in Egypt and were taken out through the Red Sea and then spent this time in the wilderness area whilst they were headed for the Jordan and went into the Promised Land. And that, as we know, that wilderness experience is meant to be the experience, a representative of the experience that we have as believers in our normal lives, various challenges that we have, God in our presence, God being present with us, but through all the things that we go through. And so this was a reminder to them of the time when they were in that wandering period and when God dwelt with them. So it was a, it was a kind of a ritual that they were meant to, to, be, to do. But as we know, as I mentioned, Christianity is not a religion. It's not full of rituals. In fact, there's only two rituals that I know of that we're asked to do, or things that are symbolic. Let me say ritual is not a good word. Symbolism. And one is water baptism. And the other is breaking of bread. There aren't any others that is like we, we, we can do other things, but those two things are very clearly for us to do. And I think God knows that if, you, if we have too many of these things, then they can become a religion. You know, it, it becomes observing these things rather than the relationship. It's one of the weaknesses that we have. We want to veer towards religion all the time because it's much easier than relationships. Relationships are tough. <laughs> They're really honoring to God. Religion is easy. If, oh, I've got to be careful because I, I can get carried away. But if you tell me that everything you've got belongs to God, that's tough. If you tell me, give a certain percentage that's easy. Give the percentage, 90% is mine. But when, it's when everything you talk to God, that's when it's tough. And uh, there's some amazing books, and in fact, secular books that have been written on this world. For you, Dostoevsky and so on, the Russian guy, uh, addresses this issue very much. But I, I've got to be careful once I freewheel because he can then. <laughs> so it's not, it's, it's not doing rituals like this anymore, although it's very important to remember things like that, like the Feast of Tabernacles. But for us, it's to know, to, this is one of the things we've got to remember. And one of the things that we start off with is water baptism. And the reason for water baptism is because it's a sign in our own lives to say, I have given up control of my life. I am dead. There's no way of saying it less than that. That is what's, what's asked of us. I have died. And I am now under new management. This is what it is to be a believer. In fact, you can't really be a, a, a disciple. A disciple. You can't really be a disciple unless you're under new management. That old man, and that is ex that is a real challenging thing to do. But the breaking of bread, in a sense, there are many elements to this. But in a sense, it is that to remind ourselves that we are under new management. Um, when I was young, as we go through life, I had a mentor when I was a new believer. This is in the 60s. His writings were very popular. People don't know him very well anymore. His name is Watchman Nee. And he wrote a book called The Normal Christian Life. And in the book, The Normal Christian Life, he says that the blood that Jesus shed or that was shed was primarily for God. It was a contract between God and his son or between the priest in the Old Testament time. We were indirect benefits of it, beneficiaries of it, but it was between the two of them. But he says, but the cross is for you. <laughs> you know, in other words, we under new management. When I want to pick up my own, no, put it back down again. And as we come before the emblems this morning, we can remember the blood and the body of Christ, the blood that was sprinkled upon the mercy seat and that opened the way for us to be right before God so that I don't have to strive and have to get all these disciplines right, that I'm right before God. That's not how it works. It works that God, through his grace, has made me right. And because I'm right, now I must try and live like, like that. I don't live like that to become right. I'm made right. 
And then the best I, and then God, because you've done this for me, help me to live like you've made me. So we remember the blood that was shed on our behalf. And then the fact that he gave up his life and that we can try and offer in a process that we learn to do our lives to come under new management. God, teach me how to, how to do these sorts of things that you've asked me to do, to love each other, to make sacrifices where it's required, and to be able to, to serve you and to honor you, to keep my relationships right before you, to keep my heart right before you. And so when the band comes up and plays a song, I think they're going to do and as we do that, maybe what we can think about this morning is, Father, how's the management of my life? As you, and apparently you, you administered from Philippians before we came here, and there's that amazing passage in Philippians chapter 2 where Jesus humbled himself to death, death on a cross. And Lord, help me to be able to serve you, to humble myself to you, to experience your kingdom, to bring your kingdom into the lives of others, this kingdom which will never pass away, such that your words endure forever. And so, Father, we bow before you and remember the time when our great high priest took the blood not of bulls and goats as the Old Testament priests used to do, but took his own blood and sprinkled it there upon the mercy seat and that you forgave us and made us your children. And even though, Lord, we remain broken in so many ways, yet, Lord, you've made us what we're not. You look at us as being part of your family, not, not unashamed to own us, even though we come so far short of what you are. What, you, what you've called us to be. And so, Lord, we take from this in much gratitude and ask you, Lord, to, as we leave here, to help us give over the ownership of our lives. In Jesus' name.